Hi, I'm K.S. Garner, and you're listening to the Solo Nerd Podcast. Today, I'll be speaking with writer and creator Trevor Mueller, here to promote his first issue of his Demon City series, Hell on Earth, now on Kickstarter until October 31st. Welcome, Trevor. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you for joining us today. But uh, outside my introduction, who is Trevor Mueller in his own words? Sure. Well, uh, I am another one of those bald guys with glasses that writes comics. I may not have an accent like Grant Morrison. Uh, I may not have worked in TV like Brian K. Vaughn, but, you know, I'm trying to trying to make it in this crazy world of storytelling. No, uh, but I'm a person who loves to tell stories. I always have. I always um, will. And honestly, like, the how how I kind of got started in comics was all about like I, I like to do film I like to do uh, movie production like those types of things but back when I was growing up we did not have cameras in our cell phones and it was not easy to film those types of things you had to get like a giant shoulder mounted VHS recording yeah. camera so comics were the easiest way to tell a story with visual medium and it has just stuck with me throughout my entire career. I started off in web comics. I do a lot of self-published work. Uh, I've done books for kids and actually won some awards with my Albert the Alien series, which is a story about the first foreign exchange student from outer space. Uh, and then now I've transitioned into Webtoon original series and now mature readers books like Demon City. Uh, so I, my goal is really to have something for everyone on my table when I go to a convention. Uh, and the question I usually ask people when they come to my table is, what do you like to read? Uh, I'm still working on romance. I'm still working on high fantasy um, and I'm still working on superheroes. But outside of that, I'm trying to make sure that I've got a little something for everyone on my table, regardless of what your tastes may be or what kind of genres you might like to enjoy reading. So that's kind of like me in a nutshell is I love storytelling and I love variety. And if I can mix storytelling with variety, I will do so because uh, it, it's a fun challenge to me. And again, there's nothing more satisfying to me as a storyteller than seeing that look on somebody's face when they have a book in their hands that they're absolutely going to fall in love with or have read and already love. Mm -hmm. So how is it for you, I guess, writing for different genres like all across the board like that like you're trying to mm -hmm. I guess eventually you're you're gonna get into romance eventually you're gonna get into high fantasy or make them all together even superheroes so but and then like children's books into this more mature series that you have here and then your webtoons originals like how is it writing all these different things and kind of like keeping track of it really <laughs> That's an excellent question, uh, because project management is a big part of that process. And at one time, I was juggling like eight to 12 different written projects at the same time, and trying to get them all out around the same time. And thankfully, those books had very flexible deadlines. So if I needed a little extra time, I could take it. Not all published projects have that um, that flexibility versus like when you're doing a lot of web stuff or you're doing stuff for yourself, create your own self-published work, like you can kind of flex the deadline if you need to, unless there's some kind of reason that you may not. With those projects, I, I had that flexibility, which I think really, really helped out. But for me, um, it's I really just kind of like pick a day and I go, today I'm going to work on this. And I just start sitting down and working on it. Or if it's a whole week that I need to work on it because it's a more complicated story or I'm almost at the end or something and I just need to muscle through with that first draft, I'll block that time and I will sit down and dedicate myself to it. I'm one of the few people that when I had a day job was uh, a person who enjoyed their commute because I had a 45 minute train ride. And for me, that was uninterrupted writing time where I could just sit down, unplug. I have my iPad in front of me with a keyboard and I would just start typing away. And how I get myself into the mood or the tone for particular stories is I usually start off by building a playlist in Spotify or whatever music program I'm using. And when I start to play that playlist, it gets me into the mentality and the mindset of the characters or the scene or the story that I'm trying to tell. Sometimes it's only one or two songs. Sometimes it's like 20 odd some songs. Sometimes like my, my Webtoon originals, I make one per episode because I named all my episodes after the songs that I was uh, listening to while I was writing it. And so it, it just kind of varies um, depending on what I'm doing. But I find that that helps get me into that mental space that I need to be in. 
in order to get those stories out and to provide as much diversity in the types of stories that I am writing or the types of characters that I'm writing so they don't all sound the same, even though it might be a completely different series or for a completely different reading group. Mm -hmm. I would use um, video game soundtracks mm -hmm. to help with, um, especially with my action scenes, because it's, it's hard to, you, it's like what you have in your head and then when you try to type down a lot of times it doesn't match or doesn't make make sense in a way, but it helped me with the pacing of it, mm -hmm. you know, which can be difficult. Um, let's see. So when you do your when you do your writing, do you mm -hmm. listen to like eight bit classic video game soundtracks? You listen to like more modern orchestral pieces, like like a Kingdom Hearts or something like that. A more modern ones, like I remember, um, I think they had just released the uh last of us the first one game sounds mm. at the time <clears throat> yeah because the, the second one hadn't come out yet so this yeah that was back in 2000 and like 14 15 yeah mm -hmm. so yeah would have been the first one um but yeah just listening to them over and over and over again and then visualizing those scenes and again the pacing so it's like mm -hmm. i kept going over the, the scenes themselves and trying to make them make sense as far as like body like can the elbow do that? Can the knee do that? Or, you know, what does that look like when someone gets punched in the stomach? Or, you know, does it have a sound? Does anybody make a sound or whatever? But it's most, it was mostly the, the pacing of it. Sure. Yeah, no, 100%. I do the same. Uh, if I need to write like a, a faster paced scene, like I'll put in faster paced music. Mm -hmm. And similar to you, but I usually use movie soundtracks. Um, and I have, I'm, I'm an old school kind of guy. I have physical media all over the place, uh, books behind me. But I also have like a whole bunch of CDs from back in the day. And so I'll put on like uh, Harry Gregson Williams score from The Rock or I'll put on the, the music from Speed or from Conan or something, whatever kind of gets me into that mood to to have that energy that is needed for that particular scene and helps to strike that tone because that also helps me. So I, I think we're in a very similar uh, similar spot with our approach to writing. Yeah. I would have physical media. If I, I have physical media. I just don't have the device to use my physical media. Like, I don't have... A DVD player anymore. I don't have a CD player anymore, so I don't know what to do with these things. But they'll come back. I'll I'll find a boombox somewhere at the flea market. I thought it was funny. We we went shopping. I have two young daughters, um, and one of them had a birthday quite recently, and we were trying to figure out what we wanted to get for. Her, and she just got into Taylor Swift music, mm -hmm. and so we were like, ah, maybe she would like you know like a, a Taylor Swift CD or a vinyl record or something like that. And the Target over by us has a whole bunch of vinyl records. What they don't have is anything to play the vinyl records on. <laughs> and so similar situation where I'm like, ah, I could go and get her like a, a record that I think would be really, really cool, but she doesn't have anything to play it with yet. <laughs> so I got to go to a specialty stop shop and try to find something like that. I'm pretty sure they sell, I, I know they sell them online. I just don't, I guess like Amazon, but if you don't want to go there, I don't know I, any record stores. I mean, I, I don't know the record store would actually sell the player because i know sometimes that obviously yeah maybe um <laughs> we're getting off track um <laughs> so what is um demon city actually about and what should readers expect in volume one hell on earth sure so uh demon city is a supernatural buddy cop story so think you know lethal weapon bad boys die hard like those types of movies but with a supernatural twist like a hellboy or a bright uh, like those types of stories. And the idea was essentially to come up with both a world that is post-apocalyptic. So it's it's after a premature apocalypse has happened for 30 minutes, demons from hell have spewed out into our world and then suddenly it stops. And now a chunk of them are stuck here. And so we've had to figure out how to live together where demons are faster, stronger, better than humans. And some of them are not all upstanding citizens because they're demons from hell. And so crimes get committed and cops can't keep up. And the seven deadly sins and the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the ones that made it over to our side of the world have become mob bosses and now are part in charge of organized crime within the city. And so the story focuses on a detective named Sheila Garcia, who uh, has a little bit of PTSD. She has lived through the literal apocalypse and has had to learn how to make herself tough as nails to live in this world. 
where she has to stare down and be tougher than these people who can literally snap her neck with a snap of a finger. And mm -hmm. she has scared off all of her human partners and nobody wants to work with her and they're about to give her a desk job until they get Horace Nightingale, the first demon detective, to partner up with her. And like any good buddy cop story, these two are butting heads until they have to come together to overcome uh, a common threat. And that common threat is their first case together, which is the last homicide that will ever happen because somebody has just murdered death and now no one else can die. And that is the setup oh. for Demon City. <laughs> I wonder how the, how do they, well, I guess you don't want to spoil it, but how did they, how would, did they recruit the, the demon to be a, a detective, a police officer? And how, I guess you say it, this is after the, um, I guess, premature apocalypse. So how long after that is it as well? You know, it's only it was only 30 minutes, but how long after? Is this like maybe a year after, two years after? Or... So three, three years after. Um, and the reason why I put it three years after is because that's how long it would take for somebody on a very fast track to make it to be a detective. Because Horace has to start from zero, right? Like he has to start from square square one. And the intention behind him is that he has a unique motivation. In the first issue, we sit there and talk about, and I think it's a little bit in the, in the preview pages on the Kickstarter right now as well, he's a demon seeking redemption. He has uh, a mysterious past from his time in hell and things that he regrets, and he is trying to make amends for the evil that he has done in the afterlife. And why that is there, I won't necessarily dive into because that is that is spoiler territory, but it, it makes an interesting premise where he is a demon who wants to live and Sheila, his partner, is a human who doesn't care if she lives. And that creates, again, a fun yin-yang kind of dynamic between these two characters that I thought was rife with banter and buddy cop opportunities uh, to have these two kind of going at each other when they need to and then partnering together when they don't, because their weaknesses also complement each other uh, quite well, so. Yeah. So how did you find um, your collaborators on this project and how did you know they were the right people to work with? Sure. Well, uh, when, whenever I approach an artist, I always ask a single question, which is, what do you want to draw? And I had found Marco online. I had never worked with him before, but he had this really good crime noir kind of art style. So think like Sin City or classic Dick Tracy, very heavy blacks. It works very well in, in black and white. Uh, we eventually wanted to, to move it over to color, and I'll address that in a moment. Uh, mm -hmm. And the answer that he gave back to me about what he wanted to draw was he wanted to draw a detective story as though it were written by Stephen King after he had read way too much Lovecraft. <laughs> and I was like, I have an idea for you, sir. And so some, I, I have a, a sheet that I call my pitch packet, which is you know a sentence or two, sometimes it's a paragraph or more ideas, right? It's just a series of ideas of things that I've come up with and I categorize them into genre or age group or those types of things. And I can tap into those whenever I approach an artist for the first time. But with Marco, I wanted to develop something unique, something I hadn't worked on before. I wanted to do a buddy cop kind of murder mystery story. I like mystery in a lot of the stories that I do. And I like themes of found family. And so the buddy cop genre kind of fits into both of those quite nicely. And so I pitched him the idea, which was the pitch I gave you earlier, it essentially was somebody has murdered death and now no one else can die. And he's like, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and so we put together a six issue, 24 pages an issue. The collection will be 168 pages in the hardcover that we're funding on Kickstarter right now. Um, but that'll be the entire story. It'll wrap up the murder mystery of who killed death and why. And then if we end up doing a sequel, which we do have an appearance level on the reward tier on there where you can appear as either a human or a demon, your choice, uh, in, in volume two, um, so we will make a sequel to it. And again, that one will also be self-contained as well. We're trying to make them like a movie, not like a to-be-continued TV show or anything like that. With uh, when, when we were thinking about color, because Marco had done the first issue in grayscale, just to see what it would look like, to see if we would like it as kind of a, an almost manga kind of looking book with his crime noir art style, uh, I had also wanted to kind of explore color a little bit. And he had worked quite closely with a colorist named Shan Benion on a bunch of other projects. So I approached Shan uh, and Shan had put together just 
fantastic colors. And Shan's understanding of color theory is way, way, way beyond my understanding of color theory. And the pages that Shan was turning in were kind of going over my head a little bit. Like Shan had to explain what they were doing in these pages to really make me appreciate it. And then I could see the genius in what Shan was bringing to, to this project. And I knew that we needed to have Shan on board as our colorist. And I have since worked with both Marco and Shan on two other projects. One's a short story that's also being funded on Kickstarter right now in an anthology. And Shan has carte blanche to do whatever they want because I trust Shan implicitly with their approach to color. It, it, it's absolutely amazing and incredible. And Shan had developed this kind of yellow aesthetic because the in, in the story, there are sulfur rounds, there are brimstone rounds and sulfur is like a neon yellow. And so that became this indication that demonic things were happening, supernatural things are happening within the story, whether or not somebody's doing drugs or using weapons or those types of things. Uh, and it was just brilliant. And then to bring it all home, uh, we got my longtime collaborator on letters, uh, Micah Myers. And so Micah and I have worked for years together on various projects. He also does the letters for my Nexus Point uh, webtoon original series. And so Micah just brought it home, right? And and provided that perfect marriage between the letters and the visuals and made sure that the the art could really sing and that the eye can flow through the page. Marco or Micah has been nominated for I think three or four Ringos in a in a row right now. So that dude is doing something right. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and I was very, very blessed to be partnered with him on this project for the letters as well. So all three of those collaborators coming together to ultimately bring this book out into the world um, and lifelong friendships have been forged because of this story uh, and us all working on it together. So it's it's been a, a blessing to work with with all of them. Yeah, I'm looking at the, the Kickstarter now and yeah, these colors are these colors are great. I like how um they're only really I guess there's only any real definition is from like the shading of mm -hmm. the um of the marker. Um if that's the correct term, I'm not sure. Um and then the colors are really they do complement each other. It's like that flash that that flash of yellow that flash of red and orange and mm -hmm. then up against the the cooler colors in the background well and, and shan and again shan had to walk me through this as well mm -hmm. but like in the earlier pages of which we have a little bit of that in the in the preview pages you've got you know the everyday colors on page one which aren't in the preview page then you've got that all hell breaks loose warm colors of hell Mm -hmm. as the apocalypse is happening for two, three pages. And then it's after that, all the color kind of gets desaturated out of the story. It's a little bit like the movie, The Incredibles, when fun, exciting things are not happening. The movie is very desaturated, almost kind of a black and white or grayscale kind of look to it. And when the exciting things start happening, the colors pop. And that is when Shan starts to go to work and really bring what they bring to that coloring experience to life. And the opening eight-ish pages, I mean, have an action sequence in there where some demons are robbing a bank because we have to establish, you know, the threat that the demons provide and, and how citizens have to kind of live in this world now where some of the demons want hell to be on Earth, uh, if you will, and how Sheila Garcia is no-nonsense, tough-as-nails, not afraid, at least on the outside, to walk into those dangerous situations. Uh, and my favorite line in there is when the cops are all hiding behind their their cop cars and the cars are blown up from the brimstone rounds and stuff. And, you know, uh, SWAT team and backup are you know, at least five minutes out. And they're like, we're not going to last 20 seconds, much less five minutes. And Sheila just drives up, gets out of her car with her partner and starts walking into the fray. And they're like, hey, backup's not here yet. She's like, I am the backup. <laughs> so... It's fun. It was fun to write. They're fun characters. And they, they established themselves very, very quickly in that first issue, which I enjoyed doing. Mm -hmm. So besides, I guess, picking your collaborators and knowing that you wanted to work with them, um, I guess, can you walk us through your creative process for Demon City? I guess from a concept in your head to it now it being, the, the I guess, the first volume of it being completed. And mm -hmm how 
the process may be similar or was it different besides the besides the like the genre of it um different from your other work sure well, this one was a little bit more involved so I, I i subscribe to uh the type of writers that that are on the plotter end of the spectrum uh versus the pantser end of the spectrum um and if you're not familiar with those or if any of your viewers are not familiar with those right Plotters like more detail, more outline, a little bit more prep work on the front end. Pantsers kind of sit down at the keyboard and just start writing whatever comes to their minds. And I feel like writing is, is on a spectrum, right? Like it's any one particular story might lean in a, in a direction or, or be more towards one than the other. And this one, I had to be a little bit more of a plotter than I normally am. My process typically starts with, you know, I have like a, a paragraph or two just describing what is the story in, in bulk, right? Thousand level view, what are we trying to do with this particular story? And I use that to start building up an outline. And my outline, or sorry, I start with a beat sheet. And so then the beat sheet is like, you know, in this issue, these three to five story beats will happen. Uh, and the next issue, this will happen. That way we'll get to the conclusion and I know how to kind of pace my story. And then I go into the outline and the outline is just a page by page breakdown of on page one, this is gonna happen. On page two, this is gonna happen or this is gonna get said. And all of that will lead down into the ultimate conclusion so that I know where my cliffhangers and my page turns are and where I need big dramatic moments or do I have enough content to fit into this particular issue or am I underpacing? Uh, and then from there, I will take that outline and go into script. With Demon City, I had to add an additional step in there, which was I needed to really know what the crime was and the motivation of the criminals and where and what they are doing while we're following our heroes through their investigation, because sometimes their two paths will overlap. And that's where we get to have the fun conflict and the action sequences within the story. And I wanted those to feel very natural and organic versus forced. Uh, why would this person be in the same location that they are just so happen to be there when they're not purposely trying to follow these people? They're also not actively trying to avoid them. So, um, so that was an extra step that I had to do with this particular process, just so that I really understood the crime, the criminal, and what they were ultimately trying to do uh, post this homicide taking place. So that was a lot of fun, uh, I think, to kind of dissect and to, to put together. It all sits in a Word doc <laughs> that nobody's ever going to end up seeing because it's a bunch of crazy ramblings uh, that make sense in my head, but probably would not transcribe to anybody else. And, and again, it's ultimately the, the script at the end of the day that my team ends up seeing, and then they translate that to the best of their ability into the finished pages that you see on there. And we'll, we'll have a couple back and forth if we need to make some corrections or changes here and there. Uh, but more or less, I mean, the team nails it. And we understood by the end of the first issue how we all worked together, how much direction Marco wanted versus how much direction uh, would be too constraining to him and would really stifle the work that he was turning in versus with Shan and the colors that they were turning in, how much direction they needed in terms of night and day tone and theme, things that were going on in the background so they could understand some of the subtext that may or may not necessarily be on the script, but would translate to the finished art and how they can apply color theory to those. So, and and that was a couple of phone calls and, and Shan picked up on it and was just turning in brilliant, brilliant pages that, you know, after the first round or two, no notes, like just completely sung. Uh, and, and then Micah, again, with the letters, like there were no notes on, on that front either. He understood humans talk like this. Demons are going to talk in a more visually interesting kind of style. Uh, all the demons uh, in, in this particular story do sound somewhat similar uh, in terms of the bubbles that he decided to use and the fonts that he was employing for it. Uh, and we may switch that up if we, you know, when we end up doing a, a sequel for it, just to give them a little bit more change and, and, and interesting aspects. I just didn't want to make it too visually how to describe like a nineties comic book where like they just had different balloons and different fonts on like every two panels. And I always found that very cluttered and distracting. And I didn't want to do that with this, which is why we tried to streamline and simplify it as much as we did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So with all of the work that you've created and completed, like the multiple comics and graphic novels over the years. So like your web tunes, originals, Netflix, uh, next, next point and repossessed, mm -hmm. Albert Alien, which you mentioned, the children's book, 
and the multiple anthologies you've been included in, um, what do you do with the work in progresses that you may have like, I guess, discarded or put to the side thinking you'll come back to them later? And I guess, what advice could you offer to other creators in regards to those, I guess, work in progresses or discarded stories? Sure. Well, it depends on why the story gets discarded, right? I think uh, on the one hand, if you're developing something and you get stuck, uh, I don't like the term writer's block, but you could uh, subscribe that term to it and you get stuck in something. It's understanding why you're getting stuck. Is it because the story is organically flowing in a different direction than when you're, where your original intention was? In which case you have two paths. You can backtrack and kind of force it back on the track, or you can just kind of lean towards that pantser end of the spectrum and kind of see where it goes, right? And see, maybe it can, you can still loop it around back to the original conclusion that you thought. Maybe it leads you in a completely different conclusion. That's part of the fun of discovery of writing. And one of the reasons why I do like it when those types of situations can, can pop up. But I've had projects before, too, where it's like the script is done and I like the artist has either not been able to complete it or uh, has gotten busy with other things or has decided to drop out of the industry altogether where art was more of a hobby than it was a career. And those projects just kind of sit in limbo, unfortunately. And for me, the challenge there is, do I find somebody to complete the work? Do I find somebody to redo the work that was already done, which is a financial burden on me because I'm paying the artist to do those particular pieces? Or do I want to transcribe it into a different media? Maybe maybe it'll work in prose fiction, like a novel versus a comic book, or maybe I would do it in film versus a comic book. And do I want to try to go down one of those paths? And in some, some instances, I, I've done one, I've, I've transcribed things into prose fiction and just said, hey, you know, things didn't work out with the artist or the thing couldn't get completed. I still want to tell the story, so I'll try doing it myself. Other instances, I've tried to recruit uh, another artist to either finish it or redo some of the artwork that's there. I have a couple of projects right now that I've got friends of mine who are actors uh, who want to make more live action projects, and some of them want to produce, and they need something to produce, and so now I'm learning how to write movie scripts. Uh, and so that's kind of fun and exciting as well. A buddy of mine uh, who works on anime is a former Power Ranger actor, and now he's like a big anime voice actor. Uh, I helped him with his script, uh, and he just filmed that movie last year. He's been in post-production on it. But again, he's like, he's doing everything. He's producing it, he's writing it, he's directing it, he's starring in it, uh, and all that. And so that movie will hopefully be coming out before the end of the year. Uh, and he's been posting it on his social media pages and stuff like that because there are trailers and stuff that he's got up. But it's a fantastic uh, action movie and very, very different from the type of work that he has done before. And now I'm also helping him to transcribe that story into a comic book format as well. And that way he doesn't have the same budget constraints or the same special effects constraints that he has in the physical world. He can tell a story a little bit more embellished than he may have wanted to or been able to. Uh, on film as well. And so that's been a fun process as well as to collaborate with somebody in a storytelling setting that I haven't done before. But going back to your original question, right? It's, do you need to just put it into a drawer and let it sit there and marinate for a while, maybe revisit it a couple of years down the road? Or is it the kind of story that's keeping you awake at night, in which case you have to do something with it? Like to me, that's how I identify the stories that I have to tell. Um, the thing that I always like to say is, you know, I've got a million ideas a second. I only have time to work on one of them. So I don't have time to tell stories that I like. I only tell the stories that I love. And if you have a story that you love that is in a place in limbo, it can drive you bonkers to figure out how am I going to get it to that next step. And if it's a writing hurdle, sometimes just taking a break from it, putting it in a shelf for a week or two, going for a walk. I find walking, doing laundry, doing dishes, mundane everyday things that kind of let me turn my brain off and go into autopilot sometimes help to generate those ideas that help me overcome those hurdles in storytelling. Uh, when you have a deadline in which you need to do that too, sometimes you need to uh, force your brain to do stuff. So again, the playlists can help or there can be other things that you can use to kind of prompt ideas to get your brain working. If you're working on a particular genre, 
reading that genre, watching that genre, playing that genre, whatever it is, just to sit there and see like, ah, is, are there things here that I can mine? Are there things here that are inspiring me that can help overcome that hurdle that is stopping me from finishing this project? Those are all easy ways that you can try to do this in a quick and simple manner. If it's something where it was a collaborative issue and the artist can't complete it or the artwork's not done or they had to move on to something else or you can't afford them anymore or whatever the, the changes there may be, that's when things start to get a little bit trickier. I, I just had a situation pop up not long ago where I had an artist that was not responsive for several months on a project that we had been working on together. And they came back and they said, hey, I'm, I'm gonna do like the next three to five pages and they drew the wrong characters. Uh, and so the, the pages that they turned in were not usable. And I realized that after six to eight months of trying to get this project going, it just wasn't going to happen. And so we kind of had to put that project on a back burner and I've shopped around to see if there's any other artists that potentially want to either complete it or redo parts of it uh on there but until then it just it sits in limbo and i i still love it i still love the story it thankfully doesn't keep me up at night which i i thank it for um but i might i might sit there and try to do it as a as a novel instead and so i've been trying to sit there and feel like how does this narrative voice that i developed for this comic translate into a novel is is the narrator annoying when I try to do it on multiple pages versus when it's just a caption that's appearing every so often. Uh, and so I've been kind of playing and experimenting with that one a little bit, which has been fun in my free time, um, but could be an option for people who may also end up hitting a similar hurdle on there is try putting it into another media and see if that works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm more of a, of, of a pantser. So I have an, I'll have an idea and I'll write it down I always have the ending in mind and so it's just like how am I going to get to the to the ending of it and I feel like for me any works in progress is um it's the issue with me is more so I guess lack of experience in order to put it on the page because I mm -hmm. wanted to like I wanted to be real even though it is fiction I kind of wanted to be like when you read these characters it makes sense to you in a way like you can imagine that yeah they would say something like this you know um and then the same thing with high fantasy i kind of want to write something based off of two of my dungeons and dragons characters even though mm -hmm. i think i actually think my dm because i played them in a, one game and then this new game i'm in it's not a new game but it's an, it's a different one and he brought in my two characters that i played before it was a cleric and a paladin and i think he actually killed them I don't I don't remember what he did with them. But I want to take I want to take them, which I was really upset. I was like, how are you gonna bring in my characters and just kill them like that? Anyway. I'm gonna tell my own stories with my characters, DM. Exactly. So <laughs> I kind of want to do, but and I want to do it in the in a high fantasy setting, but I don't really mm -hmm. like high fantasy. I don't like high fantasy because I don't really understand it. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to think, how can I make this in a way that it, it's in high fantasy and people who read high fantasy understand it? But for someone like me who doesn't like high fantasy, so how how can I do that? And it's also, I want to do like a romance type of twist to it as well. And I'm not really versed in romance. And so it's like, I have a story and it bugs me every once in a while. It doesn't keep me up at night, but it bugs me every once in a while. Um, But like, how do I actually put it down? Like, what are, what are words in high fantasy <laughs> words aren't even real words anymore so how do i take old words and make them new that's kind of how i am so sure well and i i think there are techniques to overcome those types of hurdles as well if high fantasy is not your um is not your preference but you want it to take place in that world versus augmenting your world right like you can augment your world or you can augment your story uh if you don't want to augment your world don't focus on that world uh, mm -hmm. The world building can be second place to character and character can then come first and become the focal point. Uh, if you look at, I'm going to use an author that's not popular uh, anymore, but people know their works. J.K. Rowling, right, as an example, did not do a ton in terms of the actual world building of Harry Potter on the page. 
uh, they implied a lot about what was going on within the world. And they would talk about things like sports or they would talk about things like dragon raising or all these things that were happening outside of the school. But, this, but the location of the story was very, very fixated until the last book or two where it was just on that particular school. And they didn't have to focus on world building as much where they could just talk about things that were happening in the world outside. And that creates kind of a rich tapestry. George Lucas did a similar thing with Star Wars, right? Where the story was very focused on Luke and Luke's journey, but you see elements of the world kind of peppered throughout that implies that there's a larger universe out there that has been lived in and that has a lot of lore to it. And most of that lore got explored within the novelizations and the animated series and the books that came out after that original movie. So I think that you have an opportunity where if you don't want to sit there and change the world that you're in, if you don't want to make it like a steampunk world or a more modern world that has high fantasy concepts in it, then you can just focus on character and imply the things that need to be implied about that particular world. Ah, the, the Knights Guard was defending us against dragons again. Hoo ha! Now they're now they're at the pub and they're making a rowdy mess. Let's avoid this street while we go to our destination, right? Like whatever it is that kind of sits there and implies that ah, there's more going on in this world, but we're going to focus on character and we're going to continue on that character's journey, and that's really what you're trying to write. Location becomes less important uh, than than the journey that the characters are on together. Uh, j just a, a, a possible recommendation, just throwing that out there. <laughs> I, I've never, I never thought of it like that before. It actually makes a lot more sense because I ran a game once. It was kind of like a one shot. They ran a little too long. Um, and I, I think I kind of did that not realizing that I was doing it was kind of like implying there were other things happening around mm -hmm. them that but this is what is I guess it's supposed to I kind of like trying to get them to go more towards this way so I'm like describing the stuff that's going on around them even though I don't want them you know exploring that even though they wanted to explore it it was like the whole point of it is just to tell you that this is what's happening you're not supposed to go over there and but they right. Obviously, they go over there anyway. But yeah, I you're was... reading. You're reading a newspaper right now. You're not going to that destination. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's like yeah. So yeah, that that actually kind of makes sense. I never really thought of it like at that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, and and the other the other piece I'll tell you as well because I I do workshops on on world building and I actually have like twenty two to twenty eight tips the better world building that I that I usually pull out for those. But one of the things that I like to do as well with world building, depending on how much detail you want to go into or not, is that any element of your world building should be through the lens of your character. So if there's like a big statue in the middle of town or a big fountain in the middle of town, you don't want to give like an exposition dump on the history of what that's who that person is that they made a statue of or what the significance of that fountain is and when it was constructed and how long it's been there or any of those things versus what is your character's relationship to that location, right? Is that statue a great, great, great grandmother? Is that statue something that they learned about in history and they ignored completely? Is that statue related to one of their friends and, you know, their friend is high and mighty and uh, lives this, this life of expediency and once that happened, they kind of ignored me and now I'm in my own little rut, right? Like whatever it is. Or with a fountain, right? It's, you know, one time I threw a wish in and I'm still waiting for that wish to happen. Or, hey, I had my first kiss at this wish. Or, you know, I, I saw the love of my life there and I they, they got away and I never, right? Like whatever that character's perspective is on that location can be a quick sentence or two, but expands on what your character is while it's also checking the box on the world building front. Yeah. See, I see the, how you're explaining it. I've done that in my writing with my urban fantasy that I have. So like her relationship to the city versus someone who is like, oh, like the downtown area or in this um, high traffic area here or um, riding, the, riding the light rail, riding the metro or like driving down a bumpy highway or something like that in this part of the city, whatever it is, this is her relationship to it. Um, and I don't go into huge details just more so like what she feels about it and then that's mm -hmm. pretty much it because I, I, yep. I remember i think it was like last week i was speaking to someone else about it about how we all know what downtown looks like we all know what the city looks like we don't really need to go into huge detail about what a city is it's kind of like 
you mentioned what's going on in the background and it I guess how your character feels about it or like they might just make a comment or observation about it, but they continue on what it is they're actually doing. So I guess it's just trying to take that and put it in a setting that I'm, I guess I'm unfamiliar with, or just one that I just have to just make up and just make Yeah. sure, make sure I keep track of it really. Well, again, like uh, I'm using an excerpt, but and I'm uh, paraphrasing, but like J.K. Rowling will sit there and be like, Harry and Hermione walked down a dark torch lit hallway. You don't need to expand on that, right? Like you can picture a dark torch lit hallway in your mind versus like if J.K. Rowling, or sorry, if, uh, if J.R.R. Tolkien were writing that scene, it would go on for three pages. And it would talk about the intricacy of the torches that they had on the wall and how the elven runes on them had this significance. And it reminded Frodo of this time that he was in the Shire and this meal that he had and the lights flickering on the wall would remind Gimli of blah, 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 right? Like it would just go down this winding path of world building. And you don't necessarily need to be that deep into the description if you're either less confident about that world, you have less clarity about what you want your world to be or if it's less important to you as a storyteller and the characters that you're writing uh you can you can keep it more top level and focus on character and and that works out well with with demon city uh as an example right like people know what an urban environment looks like they understand that there are parts of a city that are different from others and so parts of it are like where the rich live or where the industrial areas are or where the businesses all are and then where the residentials are. And we very quickly kind of establish what those look like and how different they are in terms of tone and feel because you've got different economic classes working at, uh, together. You've got different architecture types that are going there. Is this an older part of the city versus a newer part of the city? Uh, does it need to be flashier and more glassy and shiny like a metropolis versus dark and urban and gritty like a Gotham city, right? Like, so there's a lot of differences that you can even throw in there, even within a particular town. What ultimately matters is how does it make the character feel and how does it make the reader feel? Should there be danger here? Should there not be danger here? Should there be romance here? Because this is a romantic spot. Is this a spot of childhood memories that they reflect fondly upon? And do you as the storyteller have the ability to throw that in within your particular stories. And in Demon City, I mean, we we jump all around with all of those different places because the precinct is, is one place, the streets are another place, but then they'll also go to what they call, um, uh, the, the why am I blanking on the name of my own place? Uh, when, when, when end of days happened, they had the, the leftover crater, the hole that was created there. And it basically kind of becomes like a 9-11 memorial in the terms of my story where a great tragedy occurred here and it is a place of solemn and construction. It's still under construction. They haven't fixed this gigantic gaping hole in the earth yet. Um, and the characters go there to kind of remind themselves of who they are, why they're there and what they're doing. And it, it, they come back to that several times within the story. And that's the purpose that that location plays within the tale is to allow a moment of reflection for the characters. And I don't have to go into great detail about all the construction that's going on within that particular area or when construction will be done or who has the contract on doing construction, right? Like you, you understand what this is, what this symbolizes and the purpose of that location to the characters. And you can do similar stuff in your stories. Thank you for bringing us back to Demon City. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, but is there anything else that you wanted to share about Demon City, uh, the Kickstarter, uh, maybe rewards for potential backers um, that, you know, they can buy? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we've got a, a lot of rewards. As of this recording, or I should say before this recording, I should say we're fully funded. The, the book is happening. It's all done. And we've already hit our funding goal, which is spectacular. So uh, we've gotten really, really positive support for this. Uh, I'm looking at the numbers right now. We've got 89 backers. We're over our $4,000 goal. There are two digital editions of the book available, the Bare Bones digital edition, which has the 168 pages. Uh, and then there's a deluxe edition that also comes with a separate PDF that'll have scripts, character designs, kind of the soup to nuts, how we made the book happen. Um, there are physical hardcover editions available if you like to decorate your shelves with physical media, as we talked about earlier. Uh, I like to call that, uh, you know, book, bookshelf 
decoration um mm. and it and it works well i guess on a coffee table too uh but so the the hardcover edition is also available which does come with a digital pdf version of it or you can get the deluxe edition so you get the scripts and all the back matter in a digital version as well we've got uh reward tiers where you can get a commission from my artist marco he has offered to do a small number of commissions you can have him draw a crime noir character or you can have him draw your favorite character it doesn't matter what you want him to do uh it could be dick tracy it could be blade runner it can be wolverine it could be storm it can be whoever you would like him to take a crack at he's a very versatile artist uh and he loves to draw things so it doesn't have to be a character from our series you can also get drawn into volume two and again as i mentioned earlier as a human or a demon you pick you tell us what you want uh and it will be at least one two three pages of you in the story uh, and you will have a speaking role in the story. So that's why we limited it uh, to, to only a few people in there. Uh, and then beyond that, there's the library edition. So I have been writing again for almost 20 years. I have a very large library of stuff to read. And again, it's an eclectic mix of different genres and age groups. Albert the Alien is four graphic novels at 150 to 200 pages a book. And each of those retails for like 20 bucks. All four of those, Demon City, my last 132 page graphic novel, which was called Los Ojos, it's like a supernatural action story about a hitman who, when he looks people in the eyes or Los Ojos, does not see them as human. He sees them as angels or demons. It's like John Wick meets John Constantine. Uh, the 132 page version of that is in there, Demon City, all five issues of my Witches of Eastwick Boulevard story, and then a bunch of short stories that I have written in comic book form as well. You get all of those in a digital edition for 60 bucks or in a physical edition for 200 bucks. And considering that Albert the Alien would retail for $80 just for all of those. And then, you know, you're looking at 35 bucks for Los Ojos hardcover, 35 bucks for Demon City hardcover. I mean, right there is almost 80, 90% of what that covers. And the rest of it is all cheese. It's all, you know, it's all icing on the cake. Um, and so you can get that library digitally or physically, whichever your choice may be. Um, and then we've got a couple of add-ons as well that you can have. Again, if you want Demon City and you just want like one issue of Witches of Eastwick Boulevard or all the issues of East, uh, Witches of Eastwick Boulevard, you can add those in in the add-on section. And we also just unlocked with our first stretch goal, uh, the pinups. So there are three six by nine full color print uh, pinups that you can add on to your pledge. They're only $10. People who get a physical copy of the book can, can get these added in there. But we've got guest artist, uh, John Bivens, who's worked on heavy metal. He's worked on dark engine. He's worked on spread. Uh, Robert Carey, who has drawn The Outsiders for DC Comics. Uh, and then Ben Templesmith. Ben Templesmith, who did 30 Days of Night, is doing a pinup. And we just revealed what that looked like as part of our stretch goal. So now you can see what all three of those pinups look like. And those are available in the add-on section too. So it's a lot of story, because again, I'm a storyteller and I love to, to tell stories. So a lot of the rewards are focused on story. We've got some rewards that are focused on art, but we've got some add-ons that are focused on art as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. So Trevor, with everything that you do, mm -hmm. how do you manage your mental health outside of your creative endeavors like is there anything that you do that's strictly just for you just so you can get on your own head for a while sure um it's it's a, a great question and and one that i've reflected on quite a bit so i used to have a full-time day job and then i was doing comics on top of it and unfortunately i got downsized twice last year and so i have gone full-time freelance at this point where writing comics and then doing a little bit of marketing consulting on the side is, is really how I pay my bills. I go for walks. I like to cook. I'll check out in the afternoon and I'll just start dicing veggies and, and working on stuff that'll, that'll be for dinner later that night or something I'm going to throw on the grill a little bit later. These help me to kind of have my moments, uh, what I'll call me time, because I think that me time is, is incredibly healthy and important. Uh, when my kids go to bed, I'll usually watch a little something, maybe hang out with my wife if she wants to watch the same thing, because sometimes I watch things that she's less interested in. Um, and then before I go to bed, I always try to read. I always try to read at least a couple of chapters of either a book or a comic or something that I'm interested in. 
uh, depending on my mood, it might be related to what I'm working on, or it might be completely different if I just need a little bit of a break from it because I'm too in the head of a character and they are tragic and dark and depressing and you know mm -hmm. and I just I need a little pick me up like I need a little ice cream uh in terms of my reading right my cotton candy reading like I'll just I'll read something light and frivolous and funny and sometimes too like I recognize that if I if I start to get into a dark place because a story or a character or a situation is kind of frustrating me um it's not uncommon for me to revisit old favorites, things that make me laugh. Uh, I just rewatched The Good Place uh, because that show was hilarious and clever and witty and it made me chuckle and I needed to have that uh, because I was just going through a whole bunch of stuff that really wasn't even related to comics, but it was a little pick-me-up. It was a little something that I enjoyed and I could put that on in the background with some earplugs while I was chopping veggies or cooking dinner or doing dishes or whatever. And it, it was scratching the itch that needed to be scratched, right? Like it was, it was filling those needs. And then I try to see people every now and then when I can, um, I'm an introvert by nature going out and putting myself out there is not a natural thing for me to do. It's something that I have to kind of warm myself up to doing, but I recognize that being around people sometimes can be stimulating to myself socially, to myself mentally and emotionally. Um, but at the same time, like too much of that can also be very draining. And so it's, it's, I'm, I'm still trying to work if I'm being honest, finding the balance between what I need for that to be. Uh, and that has changed over time. I used to do 12 to 18 conventions a year and I was often a guest of honor. So I was doing panels. I was doing guest activities. I was meeting with VIPs. I was doing the after parties. I was doing all that stuff. And ever since I've had kids, like that is exhausting to me. Uh, and so I only do five, maybe eight shows now a year. And then I do a lot of volunteering stuff with my local libraries and local schools and things like that, because I like to help the next generation of storytellers to tell their stories. But I also find that to be rewarding. It's not as draining for me to do those types of things as sometimes being at a convention is and you've got to put on a smile because somebody's coming up to you and they want to talk about the latest issue of Batman. And I'm not going to lie, I haven't read the latest issue of Batman. I'm sorry. So I'm just smiling and nodding a lot and being like, uh-huh, cool. Yeah, you really like that issue of Batman, my friend. <laughs> right? It's it, the, yeah. the, the small talk can sometimes be a little draining for introverts. But I, I find it rewarding when I'm able to do some of the volunteering stuff. And even though that does involve public speaking and those types of things, I get excited about it. it. It energizes me and it gives me something to look forward to. In November, my local library is putting on a mini con and they asked me if I would be willing to MC a Smash Brothers tournament. I haven't played Smash Brothers since college. I think there've been like four versions of Smash Brothers since then. I don't even know who's on the roster, but you know what? I was like, challenge accepted. And this is the thing that makes me really, really excited for when this campaign is over, like the week after, I'm gonna be at my library with a microphone. Hopefully a bunch of kids and teens are gonna be there playing Bowser and Mario. And I'm gonna be like, it is on like Donkey Kong, let's go. I'm just going to have fun with it. And again, it gives me something to look forward to. It gives me something to aspire to do. It gives me something to be like, ah, I might be stuck with something right now, but I've got that in a couple of weeks and I'm still psyched for it. So giving yourself a goal or something to strive for or something to look forward to down the road can also be a way to overcome those. It's one of the ways that I help to overcome my, uh, my, my areas of, of being in, in, in a dark place. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I've, started to like force myself to go out because i i work like i have like a full-time job and a part-time job and all the creative stuff too so yeah. every like every other weekend i have to force myself to try to go out and and get some fresh air and meet up with a, a friend of mine or like i know someone that i interviewed a couple of times on the show um has, has came up from uh north carolina from riley north carolina and he was like i'm gonna be at the baltimore comic-con you know you should hang out and i wasn't gonna go at first because i, I was actually had to work that day and get up the next day to go to work again but also you know what he's in town 
it's only gonna be for a couple of hours. Why not? So it ended up being longer than expected, but it was definitely something that I needed because, you know, I work like 12 days straight every other week and I don't really get to do much as much as I used to, but just something small like that, just hanging out with friends or having a drink or whatever, you know, is what is needed sometimes, you know, even though you don't really want to. And I kind of was like, a lot of it is in my head a lot of the times because I'm thinking like, oh, it's going to take this long to get down there. Then like, you know, what is the, the situation going to look like as far as traffic and then mm -hmm. getting there and then how long we're going to be there. It's just kind of like overthinking. But then when you get there and you're with your company, you kind of just let that all go, which is really nice. So, 100%. And I, and I think it gets at a concept that I'm kind of working on within my head that I probably use every now and then, but I don't use consistently enough. It's it's micro wins, right? It's like little micro gifts to yourself. If I do X, if I can get through this day or this week, I can go hang out with my friend at Baltimore Comic Con. Mm -hmm. If I, you know, finish this last paragraph, I can go get up and go for a walk and give myself a little bit of a breather. If I can get through like this, these last couple of emails or whatever I'm trying to do, right? Like then I can go get an ice cream or a milkshake or something like that. Like I used to do that a lot uh, back in the day when I worked in the city with a day job and I'm not going to lie, the milkshake started to get to me. Uh, like it was a fun reward and I needed a little sugary treat in the afternoon to kind of aisle me through I had to convert over to fruit because it was just health wise was not doing to me what it was doing to me mental mental health wise uh so I had I had to pivot a little bit but it, it's finding what are those micro wins those micro rewards that you can do I mean my parents honestly used to do that with me when I was a kid like if you get good grades you get like a, a prize or for every a you get like we will go shopping and I'll buy you a book or something like that right like it's giving yourself those little rewards that keep the serotonin and the dopamine flowing that mm -hmm. keep you happy. And that's not sustainable. It's not going to be all the time. You're not always going to be able to ride high and pretty. Um, I find honestly unplugging from the internet every now and then really helps me. Like I try to be offline on the weekends because unplugging just really helps my mental health. And I, I find myself not doom scrolling as much anymore. Like I'll go online if I need something or if like there's a video I need to reference or a, or a recipe that I want to look up or something like that. Um, but I try to be as present as I can with my family on the weekends and my kids, because I know that they hopefully appreciate that. I know I would appreciate that if I were in their shoes. Uh, and it gives me an opportunity to kind of appreciate what I have and the life that I get to live. So sometimes even just as simple as unplugging uh, mm -hmm. can, can be a thing that can help you out. And if you need to unplug for longer, unplug for longer, right? Like I've, I've had times where I'm under deadline and I'm like, hey, I'm not gonna look at the internet for the next like six days. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly that becomes the micro award where you're like, yay, I'm gonna go back online again. YouTube, here I come, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, I can't. I don't, last time I unplugged, I think it was today actually. Mm -hmm. Um, because I usually listen to, I have to be outdoors, um, or as a part of my job in the later half of it. And I usually listen to music. And for whatever reason, I was just like, I don't even want to be bothered with any electronic right now. I kind of just want to be out here and be present. And I was actually just walking back and forth in the lot because we had, a, we have a lot of downtime. Mm -hmm. So just walking back and forth and this is my exercise for the day. And, you know, then I came home and had, I had a, I had a milkshake. I had my treats. So <laughs> oh, peanut butter and banana. It was nice. It was really good. Delicious. And, and banana in there's got potassium and that's, that's healthy. And then the protein from the, from the peanut butter. The peanut butter. Yep. And yeah. then I had a scoop of peanut butter too, but that ate straight from the jar. And that was another treat as well. See, and those things can again elevate that that mental that mental state that you're in, and and give you that smile on your face, and put a little pep in your step. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> All right, so Rick, um, where can people find you online? Uh, I should be super easy to find online. Trevor A. Mueller is my everything. Mm -hmm. My website, my social media handles. I'm on. Twitter, TikTok, Threads, Instagram, Blue Sky, YouTube, Facebook, find me, follow me, friend me. Uh, I'm on all the platforms and I'm trying to post 
on a semi-regular basis. I'm, I'm less less regular on TikTok, but trying mm -hmm. to be better about it. Um, but yeah, Trevor A. Mueller is, is everything. And then I've got a newsletter as well if people are interested to join. Um, but trevoramuller.com slash newsletter will sign you up. It comes out monthly unless I've got a Kickstarter going, then it might come out a little bit more often. Mm -hmm. I actually recommend the newsletter because with social media, especially with Instagram and Facebook is kind of starting to be like this too. I mean, obviously since Facebook bought Instagram, but um, like the posts are getting lost. Even if you have the note, like if you have the notifications, but it's like, do you think your phone gets flooded with not notifications? So, but the posts do get lost a lot of times because like when I see stuff, I'm like, when did this ever happen? And it was like three mm -hmm. days ago, but it's like, I, I'm refreshing my, my feed all the time. So how come I didn't see this from three days ago so like you know the newsletter i would recommend even though you get a lot of emails you should be unsubscribing on your emails how about that clean up your email and you don't have to worry about it <laughs> um i would recommend a newsletter it's just to keep up to date with your favorite whatever creators or vendors or whatever because it stuff can get lost for whatever reason in social media 100 percent. i mean yeah I, I i worked in marketing uh, for the longest time, organic penetration of posts goes to 5% or less. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think depending on the platform, sometimes it's 3% or less than the people that follow you. Mm -hmm. So yeah. unless people are sharing it widely, <laughs> you may never see it. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, thank you again to writer and creator Trevor Mueller for joining us here today to promote the first uh, volume of his Demon Series series, Hell on Earth, now on Kickstarter um, until October 31st. All of Trevor's socials, as he just mentioned, will be listed in this episode's details alongside the Kickstarter link for those who are interested. Again, I'm KS Garner, and you've been listening to the Solo Number Podcast. Thank you.